Hello, everyone. Welcome to the talk. Uh, so uh, I'm from South Jersey, Philadelphia area. So this is a good opportunity to change the topic a little bit. Um, so today I want to talk about how Philadelphia whooped <laughs> the Patriots, but uh, in Super Bowl, not just kidding, <laughs> at the Super Bowl. So all jokes aside, I'm here to talk about shiny object syndrome. Uh, again, that was an opportunity I couldn't pass up, right? So, and I'm glad, you know, I was expecting more of a rough crowd. But, uh, you guys are losing your rap. <laughs> now, so, um, yeah, today we're talking about shiny object syndrome. Uh, so how many of us have ever, like, been in a rut and we had to, like, quickly figure something out on a technical level and we start, you know, going through the Internet and doing searches and we find this one thing that, like, was you know, mind-blowing, like, yeah, this is the thing that's going to save my butt, right? Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been there. I've done it multiple times. So, um, so today I'm going to focus a little bit about on, on, on that, uh, you know, and how to kind of avoid that and keep your teams in check uh, when you're in, under those kind of situations. So my name is Angel Rivera. I'm a developer advocate for Circle CI, as Michael uh, uh, stated, uh, and my job is to basically come out and speak at, uh, to developers at a grassroots level and learn how you all are using technology and then how we can uh, better our products at CircleCI. Uh, I started my career off, wow, in the 90s, and uh, I started off uh, programming professionally at the United States Air Force. I was working for Air Force Space Command. So at that time, we were actually launching rockets, right, launching uh, people into space and in shuttle program. And I was working in, in that program for most of my enlistment. And uh, back then, uh, s developing software was quite difficult, right? Uh, it wasn't like it is today. We didn't have all the awesome tools and, and modern, uh, modernization innovation that we have today. Uh, I remember um, when I was a young developer, I was writing code in isolation, right? There was no real version control or anything. It was the save as button, save as new. Uh, and, and you had multiple files it's with the date and the time, and like, oh, wow, yeah. If I made a mistake, I'd go <laughs> back and retrieve that. Um, but I always cared about my code, right? I spent a lot of time on it, as we all do. I, I'm, I'm sure most developers, they really care about how they develop their code. Um, uh, but the problem was, you know, once I had this code developed and, and packaged, uh, I'd put it on a CD or a floppy or some network share, and it would be gone. Right? And it didn't know what happened to my code. Uh, otherwise, you know, or when, when I actually released the code, the operations team, the only time you would hear about it was when it didn't work, right? It didn't deploy right, or there was something wrong. And that was a big problem uh, for me because, uh, I, like I said, I was very curious and I wanted to know how this stuff was, was you know, after, what happened to the code after I wrote it. And I started venturing down to uh, the data center, which is, uh, you know, a few doors down the hall. We worked in a very secure facility. Uh, but after like knocking on the door a few times, they let me in and like, what do you want? <laughs> You're a developer. You shouldn't be here. And I'm like, look, I just want to know how my code is run, right? Like, they, they show me. And you know, they were like, no, close the door, walk away. Wrote some more code, <laughs> put it up on the network share. Or I started actually walking it down to to them on a floppy, and then um, that, so that they would open the door. And then once they let me in, um, they started realizing, you know, I was going to be persistent. I was going to be a problem. So they 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 I was consistent in that, and then they were like, okay, let them in. So they started showing me, you know, how they were de deploying the code. I was sitting there live with them, watching uh, the errors come up if there were any, uh, which every time, right, there was always a problem, and we were debugging together, right, at the same time. And I think. When I did that, they started realizing that like, this, this person really cares. He just cares about it. It's not, I'm not here to uh, you know, be a mole or whatever for the developer team and, and figure out like, what's going on behind the doors. Uh, but uh, and again, I, I consider myself a developer with operational tendencies at this point. Uh, so uh, I've always, ever since then, I've always worked uh, as a developer, but always in the operation shops. Like, so I maybe would last a month and then see a, they would see a problem they've never seen before 
uh, on the development team, and they go, I don't, we don't know how to fix this. And I'm like, well, that's a server issue, and I would know how to you know, maneuver and get that fixed. And of course, the operations team is like, yeah, we want that guy to be our kind of liaison. So I've always worked as a, as a liaison, and again, probably doing DevOps before it was, DevOps was a thing, right? And I'm sure there's a few in the crowd that, that also had that experience, right? So I have a story for you about uh, when I was uh, at a company on a, on a really uh, strong DevOps team. So um, again, this was a little bit before DevOps kind of became what it is today. Uh, but we had a, a strong team where developers were uh, really, really uh, good at what they did and also the operations team. And we had really good communication lines. So there were no egos, right? And I think that was attributed to uh, folks being a little bit more mature than the general, right? So we had more senior type uh, operators and uh, programmers on the team, which obviously if you have that kind of level of experience, right? Uh, and a lot of times the ego, the egos are like tampered down quite a bit, right? Because we're a little older. Um, so I was working on this team and uh, we were told to create these new features that were being requested by our customers. The issue was that uh, you know we had the previous product or the product that we were uh, upgrading had uh, more relational data structures, right? So it was flat 2D kind of model, and the new frameworks that we were trying to implement. Uh, it was a good opportunity to start, you know, upgrading some of the technology. Uh, obviously, right, we're working with uh, hierarchical data models, so like JSON, right, more of a robust 3D nested node type data models, uh, which our team was not really familiar with at the time. So we were building this new feature, right? Uh, and we were super frustrated because we were still trying to, uh, you know, uh, create the features that required this uh, hierarchical data model and using this, the 2D system, uh, which is the relational uh, databases that we were using uh, or the data, data structures. And yeah, it was really frustrating. So the stuff we came up with uh, was really hacky at best. And it, uh, it was underperforming. Um, it got to the point where we were like at, at our wit's end, right? It's, it's the, the whole dev team was just like, we can't figure this out. Uh, and we even brought a couple consultants, as believe it or not, and they were just like, yeah, uh, there's a book you should read, and we read that book, and we still couldn't figure this thing out, uh, at least to make it work in the, in the efficient enough to, to, to deploy. So uh, I had been working with MongoDB uh, in some personal projects, and it was still very new. Uh, but it definitely solved our problem, right? Like I, I pitched it to the team. I said, look, this stuff is, is, is um, it, with Mongo, the data will lie, you know, in the same uh, structure that we need it. There's not a lot of processing to go back and forth. We don't have to implement all these weird hacks that we were looking at. Uh, and it just seemed like the perfect fit. The problem was that uh, no one really had experience except for myself on the team, right? So this was a really new uh, technology. Uh, but like again, we were so desperate to solve this, we were like, yes, the team was like, this is great, uh, this is working. We installed it, everybody had a little copy on their, lo on their local boxes, <clears throat> excuse me, and then, uh, right, we deployed, uh, we started deploying it locally, we started developing on it, and sure enough, uh, I became the de facto right, <laughs> MongoDB expert, whatever that means, uh, on the team. Uh, meanwhile, I literally only read like this little pamphlet that they gave me at a meetup, and uh, right, knew all the query language, so. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Uh, but most people, right, on the team, managers were like, yes, this solves it, right? We, we had spent all this time and money. Um, so we started uh, building out an, an, uh, a MongoDB infrastructure. Uh, we did uh, reach out to Mongo for some support. And they basically told us, right, you need to deploy five nodes in your cluster and all the, the usual stuff that goes on with it. And we did that, and it worked. Uh, operations team was happy. They were like, yeah, this is easy to do. Uh, we'll, we'll put these things up. We got them up and running. They're all talking. They're all replicating data. It was all good. But again, zero MongoDB experience, right? Like, I was it. And I was, I was comfortable with it for some reason. I, normally, I'd be nervous. and like, wow, this is not good. But I was confident. Yeah, I can handle this. So we deployed, right? Uh, we, they, uh, the, app, the app was built uh, uh, on Mongo. Uh, we packaged it up. We had a nice release. Uh, stable release, and we deployed it. Uh, the, the operations team did a great job putting together the, uh, the, the nodes, the cluster that we needed, uh, and yeah, everything was working well. But it was a quick deploy, right? We did this really, really quickly because we had chewed up a lot of our time trying to get this uh, application 
uh, designed and then uh, de you know, uh, deployed. So uh, once we deployed it, project goals were met, management was happy, we were happy, we were patting ourselves on the back, right? We were like, yes, we're the A team, we did it. Uh, customers started using the app right away and they were super happy with it. It was what they had been asking for for a while. Uh, yeah, life was good. We were, you know, moving on to the next project and, and kicking ass, taking names. Until, bum bum bum, right? Fast forward 90 days, alerts from Mongo, right? The CPUs are pegged at 100%. Uh, like, the, we just had severe disk thrashing. Uh, again, <laughs> we just, uh, something's wrong, right? We got alerted. Uh, performance declined. Our customers were, you know, telling us, hey, we're timing out, blah, blah, blah. Right away, we jump into troubleshooting mode as, as, as a great team that we were, uh, very experienced, right? People just dug, rolled up their sleeves, started digging in, looking at logs, looking at performance, Nagios, all that good stuff, right? Uh, and as we were looking through and doing our, our, our uh, troubleshooting, we discovered that our users had uh, the, uh, generated over 15 million documents or records in MongoDB. And yeah, you know, this should be, this is nothing. This should be something that database should chew up, no problem. But of course, uh, once we started digging deeper down <laughs> into the problem, uh, yeah, my queries were crap, right? <laughs> they were just total garbage. Uh, I was indexing on the wrong keys. Uh, you know, there was just, everything was wrong with it. Uh, the schema was definitely inept. So I don't know if you've ever tried to take uh, a non-relational database or a relational database and create it in a non-relational um, you know, system like MongoDB. Don't do that. <laughs> non-relational means non-relational. Don't try to create, which is what we did, right? These relational keys slowed the system down. It was, it was terrible. So um, we quickly came up with, right, we did some simple math and said, all right, well, we know that after so many records were in the database, uh, we decided to triage it by moving the older records, right, into some temporary storage while the system recovered itself, which it did really quickly, no problem. But the damage had been done. Our customers uh, suffered a bad experience, right? Uh, our organizations and our customers lost time and money, which is never a good thing, yeah? And then uh, this was most impactful for me was our street cred was gone, right? The team was just decimated as far as like our confidence levels and, and and such, and we were like, how the hell did this happen, right? Like, this, we're the A team, <laughs> how, this, how did this happen? So as good teams do, we did a, performed a hot wash or a post-mortem, post right? And started digging deep into seeing like the, the real reasons why this happened. Uh, of course, my queries and uh, some other developer had some really bad like uh, inefficient programming, right? Which, that, that's common, those are easy fixes. Um, we also discovered that, yeah, we didn't run any of our like SOPs and our tests, right? Like we, the coverage was just garbage. We were so uh, desperate to deploy this thing and get it done. Um, yeah, we neglected almost everything that we we so like uh, always held true or, or, or firmly believed in, right? Our SOPs, all that good stuff, deployments, integration tests, all that stuff was pretty much out the window. We didn't do any load testing, nothing. So that that was a big problem. And this was uh, also something that we discovered. We didn't understand uh, not only the technology, but we didn't understand how uh, the philosophies, philosophies behind the technology, right? So, so non-relational versus relational. I didn't know <laughs> like anything about that, and neither did anyone on the team. So there was a there was a lot of points of failure, right? That we we kind of discovered, and we were disappointed in ourselves, severely disappointed because that shouldn't have happened. So, um, avoiding shiny object syndrome. So after we discovered all this stuff, um, I'm gonna go through a, a few things uh, here to help you all with your teams and, and avoiding you know, ha what happened to myself and other folks, I'm sure, in this room. Um, so first thing is, don't believe the hype, right? Like the marketing documents uh, or you know, uh, the, the, even the, the documentation for the product itself, a lot of times, you know, you got to understand, especially with MongoDB, they were a startup at the time, so right, sometimes we fake it till we make it as a startup. Uh, one of the things that uh, I learned from this was definitely, uh, again, understanding the whole reason why these products exist and what the, problem, the specific problems are trying to solve. And then understand that, it, you know, is, is, it, is it viable, right? What, what they're saying, is this really, uh, you know, viable? Can, 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 can this be achieved with this product? 
Um, we were looking at Mongo as kind of like the uh, all-in-one, one-stop solution to help us, right, move on. I mean, we were even talking about deploying, like, the rest, converting the rest of the stack over to this thing. <laughs> uh, that quickly, like, we put the brakes on that real quick once, once we discovered this problem because, uh, again, we didn't really fully understand the capabilities of the technology, which is, I think, the biggest thing, takeaway here, right? Understand the capabilities of this technology. And, and, and also, don't believe your own hype, right? So again, we were really confident, almost cocky, arrogant. Uh, and that was a real, um, I want to say, we, yeah, we got grounded real quick, right? When, when we experienced this and we, we figured out that uh, uh, we were not operating uh, <laughs> as, as, as well as we thought we were, right? So obviously, you want to thoroughly vet your new technologies. Um, some, some of this stuff uh, is important, well, it's important uh, to vet it, but again, um, I, I think for us at, uh, at that point in time, uh, we were so desperate that we, you know, kind of ignored uh, the warning signs. Uh, some of the stuff that I experienced when I was deploying this was um, I was the only person who understood the querying language, how to index things. And obviously I didn't understand that really well. Uh, and I vetted it you know, throughout my team, some of the DBA folks are people with DBA uh, database experience, and they were like, yeah, that looks good to me, right? Uh, <laughs> just go with that key, we'll, 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 we'll take a look at it, and, you know, it'll, it'll work. Uh, and again, uh, when you're vetting the technology, be, understand that because you run it on your laptop or on some server that's sitting under somebody's desk, uh, it's not gonna perform the same way, right, when you actually deploy it into production. I mean, these are common sense things, but I still think it needs to be said when you're playing with new technology, because uh, we always get bit, right, by those little differences. Uh, obviously, don't break, break protocol, meaning, uh, you know, if you have SOPs, if you have procedures, if you have um, uh, well, five minutes, <laughs> really, okay, so don't break protocol. <laughs> Uh, if you don't have protocols or standard operating procedures, make some, right? Uh, a lot of times I work with teams, uh, like startups, they don't have um, SOPs in place. Uh, these are great uh, uh, guidelines for like consistency as well as, um, you know, enabling people to be knowledgeable about your systems and the way you do things at your company. Uh, avoid the set it and forget it. Uh, mentality, right? Uh, we fall into that a lot when we're standing up new things and we, it's functioning, right? And that kind of bit us too as well. Luckily, we had the Nagio system set up. So technology is about people, right? And when you have people involved in technology, or in, involved, period, uh, people equals culture. And culture set our, our, our goals and our standards, right, uh, amongst ourselves. Um, so to, right now I want to take a little bit of time to talk about, I'm from New Jersey by the way, I had to <laughs> include Tony in there, uh, but I want to talk about uh, how, you know, we can, uh, just some advice on, on cultures and, and teams, right? Uh, so since I got a few minutes left, I'm going to breeze through these real quick. So I want to talk about managers, right? I've, I've managed teams, I'm sure some of you folks in here have managed teams as well. Uh, just go through some of the things that I've experienced in my life and I'd like to share with you. So I have a management style that I call sudo management. So what I mean by that is, you know, when I, when I work with teams and I'm managing teams, I like to uh, tell my teams, like, hey, I'm a peer, right? I'm a resource to you. I will work with you in the trenches side by side. And when I have to do managerial type tasks, then, you know, I pseudo up, do those tasks, and then exit gracefully and back down to the team. So that, for me, I found uh, helps people, uh, you know, diminishes those in, uh, in what do you call it, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, Sorry. Anyway, just admissions those barriers, <laughs> looking for a word here, uh, that, you know, will, will empower people to be able to do the things they do, make decisions without having to really ask, right? And I think that forms uh, more of a, a leadership kind of culture, uh, at least from my experience. Uh, again, empower your people, right? Let them make choices um, and let them make mistakes as well. Uh, Obviously, I'm sure this has been a common theme, right? Embrace the failure. Uh, actually, I actually like to reward failures in some cases, uh, especially like, you know, uh, when I work at a, a CI CD company. So we, we, we want people to fail so that you understand what's going on with your software and be able to fix the things that you know, need to be fixed. Uh, mentoring is really important. So be a good mentor to your people. Uh, make sure that uh, you know you're you're giving them as much uh, time as possible. Uh, also fostering you know uh, a, an environment where they can learn and grow. 
uh, it's really important for people to, to, to understand that as, as far as mentors go, you know, uh, not only do you have to be there to answer any of their questions, I think, uh, you know, you kind of lead by example as well. Uh, definitely, as a manager, make those hard choices. Don't sustain untenable situations. Um, you know, if something's not working for you and it's impacting the whole team, you've got to take care of that uh, before it starts, you know, matriculating through and becoming a toxic environment. So let's talk about individuals. I think this will encompass all of us here. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of like <laughs> people that say I'm not a manager or that's not my responsibility. I think if you're a part of a team, uh, it's definitely your responsibility, especially if you want to put food on your table right, and, and, and work in, in an environment where uh, you know, you're respected. Um, a lot of folks that have this attitude don't last very long on my teams. Uh, I, I just can't have it. Uh, it doesn't uh, produce a lot of uh, uh, a goodwill right, within the team. If something's broke, uh, this is a, one that irritates me a lot. So uh, I see developers sometimes, you know, uh, uh, they know what's wrong with the code. They look in, at, at the version control system, GitHub or GitLab, whatever, and right, they, they can easily fix it and then submit a uh, PR. Uh, they don't. They just call out, like, hey, this is broken, and they don't even, you know, this is not going to work, and there's no reason why. Don't be that person, right? Like, either fix it, or you know, submit a PR, or give some detail on how they how someone else could fix it, or mentor someone. Uh, that's really important, uh, and it's a, w a nice way to level up, right? As a as an individual, as a teammate. Uh, yeah, if if you're a mentee, definitely learn how to learn. I think with in technology, you definitely have to be a learner, right, and and be passionate about it. Uh, I used to get tons of uh, folks querying me about, you know, uh, things that I know were in like an SOP or something. So then they would get a, let me Google that for you, right? Uh, so yeah, just be cognizant of, of, you know, and don't overdo it either. I've seen people, excuse me, overdo it where they're, you know, trying to, um, I'm done, all right? <laughs> I'm going to keep going because I've got a few more slides. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm going to disobey. <laughs> A little rogue. But anyway, so yeah, just you know, do the research and, and don't spend too much time on it. I would say 20 minutes at most. If you can't figure something out in 20 minutes, then hit your mentor up or, or, or your teammates and, and figure that out. Uh, listening. I find this really difficult for myself personally because I'm a talker. Uh, but definitely have to, like, if you're hearing someone's opinion, you know, take a moment, let them, you know, breathe. You breathe, let them speak, and then respond, right? Uh, it's just a common courtesy thing, I know. But we're in a high-pressure job, a lot of us. And sometimes, you know, we don't have that time. Uh, and I'm from New Jersey, so like we definitely have to speak over you, right? Uh, uh, but again, I find it difficult, but just a little reminder, right? Just quiet. Uh, communication. I think communication is different. Well, I know it's different from listening because it requires both, right? Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention here was, you know, there's a lot of different forms of communication. And try to understand, be empathetic to some of your coworkers, right? And understand maybe they don't um, communicate the same way you do, obviously, right? Uh, level up on your writing skills. That's another one that I see a lot of folks, um, not necessarily like grammar or anything. It's just more like, hey, I read a text and I'm infer you know, taking away some sort of emotion. Don't do that. If you feel like you, you know, you're having bad feelings after reading someone's text, Invite them to coffee, have a drink with them, have dinner, and I promise you, you you'll be like, oh, but I, they never intended what I thought, right? <laughs> so we have these, these things in our head uh, that probably aren't there. So communicate, right? Learn, and especially in this world today, the, the way society is today, I think communication is, we have to be more empathetic, more compassionate. So in closing, tech problems are not tech problems, right? I think it's more like it's people problems, and these are easy things to solve. Um, and again, you know, let's move forward uh, from today on and build better cultures with our teams. Uh, hopefully this talk has inspired you a little bit. I know I went over, I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to reach me, uh, Twitter's great. And thank you all for, for sitting here and listening to me. Appreciate it.